Hello ladies, welcome to Homemaking Radio. I'm so blessed that you have come today to listen while you get something done in your wonderful home. And I hope you're all doing well in your present circumstances and have great plans for improvement in your life at home. Today I have a few things to talk to you about and I hope that you will just stay here for a minute while I show you what I'm going to talk about and then you can go about your business. I um, just have a teacup to show you that goes with uh, this dress and uh, I'll give you the details of all this on the blog. So if you are new here and you just came to the channel, you click the link in the description and you go to the page on which I've embedded this whole video and you can watch it all there. And matter of fact, those pages will come up along this about the same time as I do a video. And so today we always, like all days that I come here, and I love this format because you don't have to have a, a group or a church or any kind of um, a ladies Bible class pay uh, for transportation or expenses for someone to come and talk to you and you then the speaker also can stay in her own home take care of her family and I like this so much better and I'm so happy for it I hope that we can make good use of uh, this kind of broadcasting while it lasts and so we'll start out with uh, appearance and getting ready remember uh, that if you will get ready first before anything even if everything's crashing around you that you'll feel so much more positive about what you're doing you'll feel fresh you'll feel clean you'll feel pretty I hope and you will uh, be giving your family dignity and showing them respect by dressing up for the home and with a with a cotton dress like this I would probably wear an apron over that kind of went with it maybe a white eyelet apron or uh, a green sage green one and uh, sometimes I'm able to get very sturdy aprons at places like Hobby Lobby or sometimes uh, craft stores you know where they make them and sell them and so your appearance I think is very uh, important because it uh, proves that that you you are made uh, by God for a purpose and that he admires his creation and he also reflect his creation back to other people in your home and if we dress up for going out or for some formal thing why not dress up for our own people our own family our own children uh, I've had my descendants here for quite a while and I dressed up every day for them because no one might uh, no one will say anything but one day they will remember and they will know why I did it because it cheers me up it cheers them up and it shows it gives dignity to the life of the homemaker and those that are in it and so we'll start out today also with I had bought a treated myself to a magazine called Willow and Sage I don't get time to read some of these things but I wanted to just read one of the recipes in here it's all about how to make your own home remedies and out of uh, natural things and also your uh, hair products and your skin products and your home scents and things out of natural products and uh, you know they even had some beeswax candles beeswax salve and various other things so I want to read this one called rosemary water and this is in the current edition of this I'm not suggesting you go out and buy it it is very expensive but I don't have any vices and I will keep this I don't go out to eat I never spend money on um, commercial clothes I make my own so I just treated myself to this and it is something I will keep as a book because of its expense and I don't throw out the Victoria magazines the tea time magazines I have them dating back to the first issue because they are books to me and I have them in protective uh, sleeves so that I can use them year after year and I have a delightful young friend who was originally a friend of my daughter's and 
still is, who lives alone, is single, and she said that she knew that she would have to have some kind of order uh, to her life to give her a lift, and so what she does is she gets out some of those original copies of Victoria Magazine, and she tries to emulate some of the things in them, whether it's a, an arrangement on a table, uh, a place setting, flowers, um, some kind of needlework that she would do, uh, try to imitate it in some way um, through through clothing, through activities in some of those earlier magazines. And I will save these and one day someone in my of my descendants will think they're wonderful. I believe I might also have another. I've only had one other one um, because they are quite expensive. But to me, they're a book and I will not be throwing it out. And there are some magazines I do not throw out if they have good paper. This has very good paper. It's uh, quality. It's almost parchment. It's very good. And if they have good content and not many strange, crazy advertisements in them, I will keep them. If I paid for them, I will keep them. So this is called Rosemary Water for Natural Hair Growth. I had spoken to you about hair in my previous address that I uh, gave you. And so you can go about your business if you want. It looks like they've put it in a nice little jar with a stopper there. And uh, some of us grow rosemary out in our little herb gardens. And I have a brick that has a hole in it and I, I have one growing out there. Rosemary is a, and some, some people have rosemary essential oil and rosemary um, one of the spices in their cabinet that they use. Uh, rosemary is nice on uh, boiled potatoes. Rosemary is nice on some meats. Um, rosemary is a powerhouse for natural hair growth. I didn't know that. And making your own rosemary water is an excellent way to reap the benefits. Boiling rosemary leaves creates a fragrant herbal tea with a variety of benefits for your hair and scalp. Now I don't know the difference between the leaves and the little spikes if that's what they're talking about. Not only does rosemary water stimulate hair growth and thickening, but it also clarifies buildup, helps reduce dandruff, relieves and soothes an itchy scalp. So they will tell you how to use it here in a minute. Combats oil, boosts shine, reduces frizz, and can even naturally dye the hair. This natural remedy is simple to make and can be easily incorporated into your natural hair care routine. Yes, I really believe in that. I'm looking for things that are natural. This is what it, I should have brought a sprig of it in, but this is what it looks like when, it, when it's growing there. And if you don't have any, you can go to the grocery store to the produce section and it's usually in a little clear plastic container hanging up with other things like parsley and sage and other things and uh, you know for for cooking. It's over there by the lettuces and the leafy greens and you just bring one of those home. This natural remedy is simple to make and can be easily incorporated into your natural hair care routine. Use it as a hair rinse or spray the tea directly onto the scalp as growth bo boosting scalp spray. That's a good idea. Put it in a little, uh, little spray bottle and you can get the spray bottles at the dollar store or uh, other places. Sometimes even your grocery store have them for under two dollars. You will need a half a cup of dried organic rosemary, 24 large sprigs of fresh rosemary, a saucepan with a lid and a sp small stainless steel small stainless steel saucepan with a lid. Um, and you need distilled water to cover it and a spoon and a metal strainer and a container. Now I must remind you to cool everything before you pour it into anything plastic, okay? Because that'll just disintegrate it if it's not cool. To make, place the rosemary in a stainless steel saucepan and pour the distilled water over the top to cover the herbs, stirring to ensure the leaves are submerged. 
If using fresh rosemary, be sure to wash it beforehand. Bring the mixture to a boil and allow it to bubble for a few minutes. Stir the mixture again, cover the pot with a lid and reduce the heat to low. Don't skip the lid. This helps prevent too much water from boiling off. However, if you like a more concentrated rosemary hair tea, you can also choose to boil off more water. Now let's see if they tell you how to use it. Oh yes, they do. And they have some interesting containers here. I'm sure you could just put it in a little canning jar. I often soak the labels off of pickle jars or anything that I buy commercially and save the lid and use it for other things. So you could, you could put it in any kind of a jar. Leave the rosemary water to simmer for 30 or 40 minutes, allowing the leaves to steep and release their benefits. There's no need to boil the rosemary for hours, which can degrade its quality. You'll know it's ready when the rosemary looks cooked and sinks to the bottom of the pot, and when the water is the color of dark tea. The darker the color, the stronger the rosemary water. It will also have a characteristic herbal rosemary fragrance and smell a bit like tea. It's also good to drink. Rosemary's got some good health benefits. If desired, you can continue to simmer and steep it to your desired strength. Once the rosemary water is strong enough, shut off the heat and allow it to cool to room temperature. Using a metal strainer, strain out the rosemary leaves from the liquid and transfer your desired container, such as a large mason jar, a canning jar, or a spray bottle. The rosemary water is ready for use as a hair rinse, hair growth spray, scalp tonic, and more. For a gentle rosemary rinse, use one fourth cup of dried rosemary, which is approximately 12 sprigs of fresh rosemary, to one liter of distilled water. Uh, that would mean if you didn't have rosemary, you go and buy it at the grocery store over in the produce department, or you can buy it in the spice department dried. That would work. For strong rosemary water, use one half cup of dried rosemary, 24, that's in those, that's in those little spice bottles, 24 large sprigs of fresh rosemary to one liter of distilled water. For very potent rosemary tea for hair growth, use three fourths cup of dried rosemary to one liter of distilled water. This recipe is harder to achieve with fresh sprigs. Well, that's what you could do. Just use what's in your cabinet uh, if you don't have fresh rosemary. So I thought you would really enjoy this and it tells you all kinds of things you can do here and um, so this is called Willow and Sage. I found it at a grocery store. You can get it maybe, I don't know where else you can get it. Um, so anyway, I will be keeping that. It'd be nice if I wouldn't drop things, wouldn't it? <laughs> right. I'd also like to thank the lady that sent me these hardback books. I just love them so much. Holding them, reading them, uh, they are, um, you know, books that were written in 1899, 1869, etc. And I have soft copies of them that are just disintegrating. The, the back comes off of them and everything. And reading these are such a pleasure that I'm willing now to go the whole gamut and make my library full of these good books. There's something very noble feeling about walking around reading this. And I like the fact that they use the old, I guess you would call them uh, lithographs or their, their black and white prints that they illustrated things with. And this one is an unexpected offer by, from Duty to Love, 1899. And it's by, it's from a company called The Lamplighter Publishing. I don't know how to use that, but I love it that they're publishing these wonderful books. They feel good. The pages feel good to your fingers. It's just such a delight to read from good books. And this one is Stepping Heavenward. And I also like that they had put uh, pictures like from the, I've seen that one in the old some of the old McGuffey readers. So these pictures are included. And, and this is really, uh, makes you feel very noble with holding, just to hold this book, and that's the feeling of it, and um, so I'm going to try to get as many of these as I can. I'm so happy with them. 
and they smell so fresh. And I have been reading to you occasionally of uh, different things, and uh, one of them was Linda Lichter's Social, Simple Social Graces, uh, where she's recorded some things from the Victorian era, which apparently is from 1837 to 1903. And uh, she records, she, she took... Uh, the letters, the diaries, the architecture, the toys, the clothing, the paintings, the books, the, the writings, the um, games they played, the furniture, the just their music, their uh, activities and pastimes and their hobbies, their crafts, and, and uh, their attitudes, their churches, their funerals, their weddings, and she did such great research in here on so many different things uh, to show their values and why they did what they did. I know many people misunderstand the Victorian era, uh, and it's been given bad press by modernists because, I mean, if you want to promote your own era, you, what, what you have to do, because it might not be such a winner, is to... Uh, is to demean the previous era and uh, that's often how people win uh, arguments and stuff that they just start demeaning the other person and in a way that is what happened to the Victorian era she wrote about it in the front of the book about how the 1920s moderns smashed the Victorian era because they were going to bring in this new modern area where era where everyone had to be modern and uh, they were going to get rid of all the Victorian repressed sensibilities. You know, they talked, they said that these people were just um, repressed and not happy. And so they were going to be outright, outrageously happy and, and gleeful. But I'm reading from a chapter here about the Victorian uh, architecture. Uh, they, she calls it aesthetics. And it's about the towns that they had. And one of the things that I like to do when we travel is go to the old highways and go those routes so that you can go through the, some of the original towns and and see things. And when you get on the freeway, it bypasses all these places. And uh, that's somehow why some of these towns just kind of die out because there's not as much traffic coming through them. But I like to go into the old towns, see the old buildings, walk around on the sidewalks, uh, go into some of the antique places and restaurants and enjoy my country and every country has those places um, so she calls this recovering our environmental aesthetic now why would this be valuable to the home well as I read it I'll make a few comments about how we can improve the home by going back to the old standards and the old paths where the good walk is so not everything in the Victorian era was good. They had their share of scalawags, just like we do, and uh, they had they had just as it was part good and part part bad, just like every single era. And you had to choose the way that you wanted to go. Increasingly, cities and neighborhoods are implementing policies based on. Victorian atmospherics, unaware of their origin or age. For example, uh, there was a coining of the broken window theory of crime and urban decay. In essence, it stated that ignoring small infractions, like the breaking of a window that stays broken, can propel a snowball of similar offenses that eventually devastates an area physically and morally. As vandalism spreads, residents become apathetic and withdraw from public places. Once predators see no one is in charge, drug dealers, gangs, and assorted thugs claim the turf. Well, I got to reading that and thinking about uh, a bare uh, space in, on my cabinet in the kitchen or some place that is bare where people tend to put one thing. Maybe they'll start by putting the mail there or putting their keys there or setting down a receipt or something and pretty soon someone else sees it comes along sets something down beside it. it just seems to attract other things like a magnet and that is one thing I try to 
I try to walk through my house and go to find these areas that are troubled troublesome areas for me where they tend to collect all this stuff and uh, make myself handle things only once put them away where they belong only once when I bring in the mail it does not leave my hand into another stack or another pile every item goes where it's supposed to go and I never touch it again unless it's a letter I have to answer it will go in my little letter box but other things don't if, if they need to go in the trash, they go in the trash first thing. I don't let them hang around. Now, that is, but because that's true, just like uh, some uh, broken windows attracts the wrong kind of activity and crime, I call it uh, a kitchen crime, you know, when people start setting things down, even a, a twist tie or a, a any kind of thing, a clip or any kind of thing, even a kitchen thing, even just the wrapper off of something gets set. That to me is like one piece of trash it just att attracts more kitchen crime. <laughs> so the innovative notion that minor crimes trigger progressively larger ones harks, harks back to the holistic Victorian philosophy we have seen applied in many other contexts. The fashionably uh, novel idea, and novel is in quotation marks, that reversing physical negligence and destruction reduces, reduces crime is pure, old-fashioned, aesthetically flavored common sense. You see that even in your own home. It just becomes, when it becomes high-end looking where the surfaces are clean and there's very little clutter, uh, there's more respect for it and for myself I've noticed since I've been kind of catching up after having um, a lot of people here for a long time that uh, <laughs> it's easy for me to plop one thing on top of another before I finally get it all cleaned up because it's already there it's already a mess it can't get any worse but I like what she says here she says the fashionably novel idea that reversing physical negligence, when you think of your home as that, reverse physical negligence and destruct, destruction like destructive areas, areas that look like there's been a cyclone that has gone through it, reduces crime is pure old fashioned aesthetically flavored common sense. When you make your home aesthetically pleasing, that means uh, you look at it and it's pleasing to see because everything's put away or just relatively clean and neat. Uh, there's a respect that you feel and you tend to walk differently you tend to speak differently uh, maybe even more properly New York City has been especially aggressive in targeting the petty quality of life violations it once ignored such as graffiti ear splitting music subway turnstile jumpers panhandling and etc gone are the infamous squeegee men who cleaned the windshields of cars stopped at red lights. The crime rate in the city has plummeted and not surprisingly police discovered that many of those arrested for misdemeanors were had links to felons. So neatness and tidiness and cleanliness attracts a peacefulness and, and peaceful people. But somehow people that are attracted to uh, places that have infractions of neatness uh, are not always up to any good and there are sometimes people like to hide behind a mess so she went I had already read this to you about their their different style of furniture and the different styles of houses and about Alexander Jackson Downey and the other person that was a designer And uh, so now I'm going to read to you some more from the Jane Austen diet. And there's a chapter in here on the mind-body connection. I did not finish reading the chapter on tea drinking, but I read quite a bit of it. And this is all about how our thinking, uh, the, the Austenites, the people in the Austen era, which was, it probably began... Uh, 
maybe at the time of the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution in the 1770s here in the U.S. Um, and the uh, Victorian era began in the 1830s. So it was before the Victorian era. Cheerfulness gives new elasticity to our limbs and our circulation. And someone who could use a good circulation of her juices is Mrs. Smith, Anne's closest friend in persuasion. Though suffering, now I don't know if you remember the uh, 1990s movie rendition of this, it was quite nice, and Mrs. Smith was such a nice, cheerful person. Uh, she was she was apparently in poor health, but uh, very very nice. And though suffering from a crippling illness in dismal living conditions, with no money to pay the doctor bills, Mrs. Smith remains remarkably positive and upbeat throughout her trials. Wouldn't you like to have that reputation? Most everyone I know, at one time or another, does not feel good. The true test of good character is whether you can be kind and loving and sweet. And have a good temperament in spite of pain, in spite of not feeling feeling good. And a lot of people use their ill health as an excuse to be bad tempered. Uh, and if you would like someone to help you and look after you when you're not feeling well, then you better be nice because no one will come and no one wants to help you if you're not good company and if you're not grateful and if you're not if you're not uh, kind. You can still remember to be kind even if you're in pain. Um, Mrs. Smith had a de deposition to be cheerful. Neither sickness nor sorrow seemed to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. Now wouldn't that be a nice little thing to write on a piece of wood or paper to put somewhere in sight on your house. Neither sickness nor sorrow seem to have closed her heart or ruined her spirits. You could say, let neither sickness nor sorrow close your heart or ruin your spirits. It pays off. Her cheerful mind soon becomes a mysterious pathway to her medical cure. Mrs. Smith's cheerfulness and mental alacrity did not fail her and she gradually experiences improvement of health by the end of the novel. Putting it in modern terms, Austin, I'm trying to see how much time I have here. Putting it in modern terms, Austin was one of the first novelists to promote the power of positive thinking, boldly claiming that health and good humor and cheerfulness are biologically connected. It was her infamous shove it to the uh, the Descartes splintered medical theory. Remember that was a, a physician that believed that the mind and body had no connection at all. And it would prove to be scientifically centuries ahead of its time. Not until the 1980s would researchers first discover that Descartes was wrong and there is a direct bridge between feelings in our heads and functions in our bodies. Now studied appropriately under the massive bridge-looking term of psychoneuroimmunology, -neuro scientists have found that our mood matters, particularly to our immune system. Positive emotions like happiness and hope allow our brains to release chemicals that strengthen the immune system whereas negative thoughts release chemicals that suppress it. In short, happiness makes it easier for your body to fight illnesses and heal more quickly from them. And I would add that uh, a cheerfulness, good nature, and happiness can add to your ability to uh, manage your home. And when things look the most dismal, will get your help you get up and get at it and um, one of the things I like to do is put in uh, persuasion and play it in the background while I clean up messes that looks like you they have there is no end to it or hope and I'll surprise myself and be amazingly uh, thrilled that I could actually get it all done and I mentioned uh, in several of my videos to begin with a list 
and write down, if, especially if it looks bad, if you've just moved or if you've just had a lot of commotion in your home, haven't had time to really keep it up, and you end up with a lot of things that you're behind in, to make a list of the things that have to be done and then ask God to help you complete it. And don't let your daily life at home be powered by negative news or bad reports. And remember Philippians 4, 8. We say it so much it just becomes kind of trite. Oh yeah, I know, whatever's good and lovely. Think about that. Uh, when you are to get yourself out of a bad habit of thinking down and thinking um, very negative and hopelessness and unhappiness, correct yourself by right away thinking of something good, thinking of something you'd like to see, thinking of something you'd like to do, or you'd like to make, or how would you like your house to be, or what would you like to have happen. You start thinking about that and getting a more positive view will give you the energy to do it. And I think you have lots of less less aches and pains as um, as you do it. I would like to go on to some other things, and I always like to cover uh, a few manners while I'm on here uh, for the home because manners in the public are not more important than manners at home. And from a home will flow those manners. If you learn manners at home then you don't have to suddenly switch over and pretend when you're out in the public pretend to be a mannerly person be a mannerly person at home and you don't have to change you just you're, you've got manners at home you dress up at home you dress up for the public you speak politely to people answer people when they speak to you you don't have to give any personal information about yourself in answering but just acknowledge that they that you've heard them and uh, and speak back or you know and also be tactful um, in manners we use tact not attack and so it's best not to confront people avoid blunt or straight on attack otherwise you're in for trouble because people will always resist that resent it and want to pay you back so it's just best some things are worth ignoring. You know there's a scripture that says it, it is an honor for a man to overlook a fault. And you don't have we don't have the business of going on going around correcting everybody and picking on anyone. I remember one time years ago there was somebody walking around in a store and he was uh correcting everybody, picking on them and uh, uh telling them they were uh in the way or that they didn't put the item back properly or something and after a while people were just avoiding him and uh, the store became totally emptied <laughs> so if you want to uh, empty your world yes you can be rude and blunt and and uh, you can be critical and then uh, that will clear the people away if you don't want any people around you um, but I think it's also important to help your children to to live a happy life by showing the example and uh, so that if they choose when they get grown up if they choose to reject your way of life you will still be building a life that's good and pure and happy and uh, noble that's very very important to do what you want your children to do to be what you want your children to be uh, if you're argumentative, they're going to be argumentative. Uh, if they see you picking fights with people, then that they're just going to emulate that. Your life at home is can be your own high society if you decide to do it that way. If you decide to have uh, the type of house and home that's comfortable but neat and clean and you have you speak to one another as though you're all human beings not dogs and cats uh, and speak clearly and not rudely and try to avoid uh, the unpleasantness and horrid experience of the contradicting arguing that goes on sometimes people will say their children drive them crazy with all the fighting and everything but uh, 
they may be in some way picking up on something that they're around or hearing. They will be most like the things that they are around. Now, I think that that is all for today. I'm making it a little shorter. I'm going to have to save my voice and I'm not sure uh, how much time I have left, but I hope that this has been uh, valuable for you and that you got a few things done while you were listening and I just remind you uh, look your best, be your best, uh, speak your best and treat the home as though it, it is something that's just as important as though you were visiting a high-end place and uh, it will be the place that you desire to be the most. And so I hope you'll stay close to Christ, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.